All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, it is time for another fantastic, super cool bonus hour. No, it's not. Not time for the bonus hour. Shut up. <laughs> no, this is it's time for your regular normal one. We've got a special guest for you coming up today. Charlie Brown, Charles Brown, Charlie to his friends uh, from MKS Supply. Been in the industry for a long, long time. We've got a bunch of stuff to talk about. We've got. Oh, I've, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can wait, but I can't wait. Uh, we've got an announcement for you. We teased you a little bit. We teased you a little bit with this, and uh, it's happening. We talk, we got a Brownells bullet points for you today. we got a Duracoat finished firearm for you today. And uh, then uh, we've got some other stuff. So stand by. This is happening. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear. We also discuss current events and politics, because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping owner, Zach Martin. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. Yes, indeed. All right. Hey. Uh, this is going to be kind of a weird one today because we, uh, well, it just is. We are here. We're live right now on our Discord channel. Are we not, Zach? Is anybody listening on the Discord? Uh, we are currently live in the Grad Program Discord because in of the, technical reasons. That's right. Grad Program Discord. Hello, Grad Program members. Uh, and uh, if you are a Grad Program member, you know who you are. All right. So this is it. This is it. Uh, Welcome back. Frog lube. Yes, indeed. A lot of you guys who've been here with us for a long time, you're like, what happened to frog lube, man? How come? You know, I was using it and it was extreme. We, we went by the booth at NRA and told Larry, extreme. Well, they're back. They're back. Uh, and we're not going to do any inside baseball, but they're back. And, and uh, we, we never didn't not like them we we always you know we didn't just not like them and we just um we were they were doing stuff and we were doing stuff and uh but uh, frog lube is back as an official and official sponsor of student of the gun radio and i did not realize this but well i i mean i guess i should have known but frog lube it was founded in, I think, 09, established in 2009. Yes, 2009. And I mm -hmm. met Larry like right in after 2011. That. Yeah. So it was, it was such a weird thing because uh, you, you met him at a local to you. I, at, 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 the, at the gun shop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I walked he, into and, the gun shop. He was like at the at the phase in the business where he's like, I'm going to go personally visit these gun shops and let them know what this frog loop stuff is. And then just, you know, God put them together in the same gun shop. It, to, that to was crazy. Other. And if, if it wouldn't have been for that, I don't know if we would have ever become acquainted. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we would have, but small industry. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's that's, so weird um, to think that somebody that didn't live in that state was in that state at that gun shop where you were at that moment in time. Yeah, and like I was going there to pick up a gun, and and uh, and I, I'm not—I don't remember who Larry was with, but it was it was Larry and another guy, and uh, he was going around and he was like talking to gun shops, and uh, that's the way you do it, man. That's what 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 was the name of that gun shop in Biloxi? Cooks. Cooks. Yeah. Wow, I forgot about that. Cook's Gun Shop. Hey, Cooks, are you guys listening? Uh, they're like, what? Who's this guy? We know him not. <laughs> if you guys are in Biloxi, though, if you're in Biloxi, uh, Mississippi, and uh, you know of Cook's Gun Shop, they, they were our, our friends, our partners, our pals for oh, like 10 years, uh, almost. Almost like that uh, was about 10 years. So pop in there and say, hey, man, student of the gun sent me. And they'll be like, what? Are they still doing that? <laughs> yes, they are still doing that. And so, so uh, yeah, you figure I met Larry in 2011. Uh, it was 11, 12 time frame. But uh, 
and they've been with us uh, they were with us and and then they didn't and now we're back and so it's all good it's if, all if good go to studentofthegun.com slash frog loop it'll get you where you need to go to learn more about that product well there you go there you go support them because they support us please that's right you need to, you need to tell those guys and phil phil's out there phil are you out there phil at last nra walked right up to the frog loop booth and said hey why aren't you partnering with student of the gun and they're like whoa 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 calm down calm down there guy so they fulfilled their obligations to you phil yep yep yeah so there you go all right so there's that there's that and we we were unsuccessful in in our endeavor to get Durco to develop a frog loop green. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it just didn't happen. I don't know, but that's a, that's okay because you know what they have? Well, um, as soon as Zach plays the song, I will tell you what they have. <laughs> it's a challenging game. <laughs> So there's that. So there's that, Mister. That's that. So, uh, what do they have at uh, Durco? Well, in case you guys have been living under a rock or haven't been paying attention, I know there are new people out there. I know there are new people out there. Uh, they did develop a color in conjunction with Student of the Gun. Yes, indeed. Uh, and it is called slightly darker black. That's right. Uh, and if you don't get that. I, I feel sorry for you. Quite frankly, if you don't get the reference, I, I kind of feel bad for you. Uh, but we did uh, several we'll, years ago. We'll help you fix it. And you go to go watch the Archer. That's right. Go watch Archer season one. Uh, actually, there's a there's a there's a callback. There's season season one. And as a matter of fact, isn't it the pilot episode? Yes, it is. It's the pilot. Okay, it was the pilot, was and then there's a really yes, and then there's a callback in season two. Yeah, buddy. Oh, um, so slightly darker black. Is it aubergine black? Slightly darker black? No, it's more of an aubergine. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pop music. I'm talking about the fact that that Duracoat has not one, not two, but one, two, four, six. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve different shades of black, but the best black of all, and the one that you should be concerned about, the one that you should be purchasing and using, is Student of the Gun Slightly Darker Black. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And speaking of Student of the Gun, I believe, is there still a gun tattoo? Gun tattoo. I'm going to go look up gun tattoos. Uh, and there was last time I checked, but I'm going to check again on the website. Yes, there is an official student of the gun SOTG logo gun tattoo. Oh. So when you do your custom Duracoat job on your gun, not only can you use slightly darker black, which you should, uh, but you can go to the gun tattoos and uh, you can order yourself some gun tattoos and get a, an official student of the gun gun tattoo. And so what I did is I went to studentofthegun.com slash Duracoat. Then you go over camo and designs, go to gun tattoos. I'm going to click it and it's loading. And I see, oh, yeah, look at that. There's a style called SOTG logo fighting solves everything. And that yep. is it right there. There you go. There you go. So get it done. Get her done there. There you go. Uh, check out our buddies at Duracoat Firearm Finishes.com. All right, moving on, moving on, moving on. We talked about the state of the industry with our buddy Charlie Brown. Uh, we're going to get him up. To, with, and we're, that's coming up in the very near future. And the latest, the newest video on Jukesy.com, studentofthegun.com slash Jukesy, is the Canik MC9 Mate Pistol Review. Yes, indeed. 
that is on there and you can go avail yourself to that right now this very second if you'd like to if you don't want to i don't care do whatever you want you're a grown man or a grown woman but this is the time that i'm quiet and i invite you to listen just a little bit louder attention new listeners we produced a complimentary online training course called seven training tips that could save your life Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. All right. Brownells bullet points. As always, this is our this is our hardware section. You guys want to talk about guns and stuff and stuff and guns. This is this is where we do it. We do it during the Brownells bullet points segment. And there's actually two things I want to talk about today. Uh, yesterday, I was out doing some training practice um, with an AR-15 style rifle. And I had the 86 a freaking magazine. It was an aluminum magazine that apparently I've had for a long time. And I was having stoppages and I was getting really mad. Well, um, and it wasn't it wasn't the gun, it wasn't the ammo, it was the freaking magazine. Uh so I pulled that magazine apart and uh that magazine is going in the trash. Now, the reason I bring this up is because you need to understand that you should understand that the reason that we have detachable or, or, or interchangeable magazines, the magazine is a, uh, I, I, I can't hate to use the term disposable, but it really is. Uh, magazines for, for semi-automatic firearms are disposable. Uh, they're meant to be easily replaced. So let's, if you had a fixed magazine gun, let's say, you know, because you guys understand that there are rifles and shotguns and so forth that have fixed magazines, right? If you had a, a gun that had a fixed magazine and there was a problem with that, well, you'd have to send the gun off for repairs, right? You, but with a detachable magazine gun, if the mag screws up, it's easy. It's an easy fix, right? You get rid of the ones that's screwing up and you put in a new one and boom, your gun's fixed, which is exactly what happened to me yesterday. I really, you know, I have, I will admit to you, I have a box of magazines that I use for training and practice. And I grabbed some magazines out of that box and I went to the range and the one magazine was screwing up. I'm like, all right, I'm done with you. You're finished. I'm going to replace you. Uh, and you say, well, what should I do? And all, all of my magazines are either, um, the ones I use for training are either aluminum GI Joe magazines, you know, mil spec GI magazines, or they're P mags. Um, that's it. And, uh, the one that went crappy, the one that crapped out on me was an aluminum GI mag. And you know how they all look pretty much the same. Well, this one looked pretty much the same and I have no idea how long I've had it, how many times I've used it, hundreds, thousands, whatever. So uh it's it's okay i'm not going to cry about it but what i will tell you is uh if you are going to have an ar-15 style rifle uh, and you need magazines for it number one if you have a, a detachable magazine rifle an ar or an ak or an fn or whatever this is what i'm going to tell you you need to have a minimum i did not say maximum I said minimum of six magazines for that. Like, what? Six magazines? It came with one. Yeah, I know it came with one. Uh, but here's the dealio. Uh, if you're serious about it, if you're serious about what you're doing, then you need to have a minimum of six. I didn't say you have to carry six magazines on you all the time, but you need to have at least six. And the price of magazines has pretty much stayed the same or gone down. Uh, they're, they're running sales all of the time right now. They're running sales all the time on magazines. And uh, right now, 
Jared, can I can I give you a hint? Yeah. Uh, the the Gen three, the PMAG Gen M three, which is the up to date version. This is the one that the Marine Corps buys and so forth. They're on sale at Brownells for eleven dollars and ninety nine cents a piece. Nice. And if you and if you buy a pack of ten, it's even less expensive. So here's the deal. So long story short, uh, when it comes to rifles and magazines, right now they're on sale. They're they're, they're bargains. They're not going to get cheaper. <laughs> yeah, they will. Mm. No, they're not. So uh, if you if you don't have at least six magazines, good magazines for your detachable magazine rifle, whatever it happens to be, go ahead and get them. And the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is I wanted to mention the uh, EOTech optics. EOTech, if you haven't checked out EOTech lately, well, they're better. They're back and better than ever before. I never had a problem with them previously, uh, <clears throat> but uh, they're back and better than, than they ever have been. They are HW and EOTech HWS. And you're like, what is an HWS? It's a holographic weapon sight. You're like, yeah, like a red dot. No, it's not the same technology. I know that the optic, that the reticle is red. Um, and then you see the red and you think it's red dot, but it's not. The, the truth of the matter is the center dot, if, if you use an EOTech with the 65 MOA ring um, and the center dot, the center dot is actually a true one MOA dot. And this is people who don't like, yeah, they all are like, actually, no, they're not. <laughs> actually, no, they're not. The reason that they can do that is because it is a projected hologram. It's not a traditional red dot. Uh, and if you've never used uh, an EOTech, uh, if you've never used one or if you've never used a holographic weapon site, it's a different animal altogether. And you can, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be doing an article and a review actually uh, uh, with the new ones, and it's going to be coming up in the very near future, so we'll talk about that. But uh, yeah, EOTech, it's uh, they they were the long story short is they were their own company. Then during GWAT, when all of the investment bankers were investing in gun stuff, you know, the military stuff and the gun stuff, they were purchased by a huge investment group. And what do we know about gun-related companies when they get purchased by, and this is just, just not an EOTech thing. This is an everybody thing. Remington, DPMS, Bushmaster, blah, blah, blah. When gun companies get purchased by investment groups, eventually the investment groups get bored with their, their new toy. It's not a new toy anymore. They get bored with it and they don't care about it and the brand languishes and then you guys the customers are like hey what's up with derp derp company they used to be good and now they're crap it's like yeah welcome to the world of investment bankers how many times have we seen this seen this playing out jared like a lot <laughs> yeah many well look at look at the former blackhawk the clothes the rain suits, the the uh, the layer systems, all of that. Remember, all right, Jared, best rain suit you have came from Blackhawk. Blackhawk, right? Yeah, the, the layered system. Yeah, the, the 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 rain suit, the layer system, the all of that really good stuff that we use that I've used in the field for over a decade, fifteen years or more. Like, oh, I'll go buy one of those today. No, you won't, because they don't have them anymore. It's all discontinued. What are you talking about? Why'd they discontinue it? Because they were purchased by an investment group. A big investment group bought them. And they went in, they said, kill 80% of the products. Kill 80% of the product line. Look at what happened to Cold Steel. Cold Steel had some of the coolest, most unique, things you could buy right 
Lynn Thompson special projects, all of that stuff. And and you're like, I just went there and how come they don't have that stuff anymore? Because they were purchased by an investment group. And the investment group comes in and they're like, keep the top 20% of the of products and kill the rest. And that's what happens. That's our industry. And what happened with EOTech was they were purchased by an investment group. And the investment group's like, oh, we don't care about you anymore. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna brand you, we're not gonna market you. Well, fortunately, that investment group does not own them anymore. They're owned by a private company and the and the investment group, they came in. This is my favorite thing, Jared. When investment groups come in and the guys who have been working at that company for 10, 15, 20 years know the industry, know the company, the investment group comes in and says, yeah, we don't need you guys anymore. You, you can just go away now. We're The smart people are here. You, you dummies who have only been working here for 20 years, you don't know what you're doing. And then they get rid of all those people that know what they're doing. And, and weird, strangely, the, the brand suffers. What? And like I said, this is not just an EOTech thing. I've seen this. Uh, how many play out over and over and over and over again? So the good news is EOTech's back. They're a privately owned company. They hired back the smart people that used to work there before the investment group took over. And uh, they're back and they're better than ever before. So there you go. So that's that, Mr. That's That. <laughs> and of course, you can get those from brownills.com. Yeah, that's right. Go to brownills.com and check them out. Hey, Defiant Munitions. We didn't, I don't know if we talked about this. We need to make sure, Zach, Jared, Hello. that every time we do this show, that we remind people to go to Defiant Munitions, Defiant Munitions, and use the promo code SOTG. Or click the hyperlink, go to studentofthegun.com slash defiant. And then when you go there, will it, will it automatically, it just takes you there. Or does it automatically add the code? Use price? the code. Yeah. Use the code. Yeah. It's SOT. Use the code. You save some, you get a discount. So you save some ducats. Right. So you're going to get premium ammunition and you're going to save money. So there you go. I think that's a good thing. And uh, they support us. We support them. All right. We're going to do uh, one more plug. This is when I shut my mouth and I let Zach talk. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed you do. Over at ShopSOTG.com right now, we've got the Always Armed Kit currently on sale. Right now it is concert season, it's convention season, people want to go out, do things. But as we know, sometimes there's you know a little old lady standing there with a magnet wand who is not going to let you get through with anything you use to defend yourself. Well, that's where we come in. With the uh, official CIA letter openers and the EDC knuckle carrier, you do not have to be completely disarmed uh, ever. There you go. That's right. Uh, it's not really convention season right now. It's concert season. I needed more than one example. Uh, <laughs> I needed a second example. There you go. There you go. Um, and, and you kind of feel like James Bond when you walk through and you're like, oh, you're like, you're good. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I am good. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I am good. Yes, yes. And indeed. The funny thing about some of those magnetometers, they're turned up so high that somebody could have a spider co clipped into their po- with a with a polymer handle clipped into their pocket and walk right through somebody might have done that <laughs> and then said whoop <laughs> whoops i guess that worked so uh, yeah <laughs> you just don't know you just don't know all right the next voices you hear are going to be those of charles brown and Jared Markle and Paul Markle. 
All right, here we are. It is time for another Student of the Gun Radio. Aren't you excited? If you're not excited, well, prepare to be that way. Uh, what we've, Who we have with us today, we have one of my oldest friends in the firearms industry. Uh, we've known each other for, what, since the 90s, right? Yes, it, yes, for sure, early 90s. Back in the 90s when things quite frankly seemed a little bit simpler we didn't we didn't know it back then we're like wow things really suck no then it was pretty calm but uh, his name is charles brown but charlie to his family uh and his friends he his father and it, he's you're a fourth generation is that correct fourth generation yeah, fourth generation in the farms business yeah so his father and grandfather started the first pay to shoot range in ohio in 1953 and they conscripted Charlie to sweep up brass and build target frames and stuff when he was just a little shaver. Um, More of like an enslavement. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so he, Charlie's worked in the retail business, fishing, archery, hunting. Um, you have you're, He's a smart guy. He has a double major in marketing and management. Uh, is there? Did you throw any social justice in there? You, you didn't. You don't have, no. You don't have Not a major in social justice. <laughs> oh, okay. No. Uh, he's been he's been a salesman. He's been a dealer. He's worked at big box stores, and he's had MKS Supply since what in the nineteen nineties. Um. Uh. Yeah, I've been there since about ninety four, and then mm-hmm. I become an owner in a, in a two oh six. Yep. And then yep. you have also passed on the tradition uh, to your your daughter. Is your daughter your, your eldest? Is Kara your eldest? She is she the is first issue? My second second daughter. Second daughter. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's the uh the dreaded middle child. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and that explains a lot, actually. Well, yeah. Because <laughs> you know her, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and you uh, your grandpa and uh and which is probably you know what what did Solomon say? Uh grandchildren are the crown, the the crown for the old. Yes. <laughs> And my, my grandchildren were just here. I, when we when we do these shows, I get to see my grandbabies. And uh, awesome. what did she? What did Ruth say? Oh, she climbed up it into Jared's chair, and she said, "I'm going to work now. You have to leave. <laughs> mommy and Daddy leave. That's a no, Mommy and Daddy door. Right. Yeah, yeah. See you later, kid. Do my work, please. <laughs> oh, I wonder where she got that. It's like I'm going to work now. You have to leave." And it's Jerry's almost like, like she's come in here before. <laughs> yeah. Like, what What are you going to work on? I'm going to work on stuff. She said she's going to work on stuff. So, oh, uh, but that, that, and Charlie, uh, he and I, we had a, we had a conversation last week and um, this is a conversation that we, we have pretty frequently. We, now, do, you, do you remember when we had the last state of the industry? You and I, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was right before the, the election um, right. And we had the, we, we talked and, and we had this uh, conversation. Where, what do you think? I said, and I said, I don't think there's any way that the dementia riddled meat puppet can become the president minus massive fraud. Yes, I said that. I made that prediction. Thank you very much. You did. Uh, but here we are in the year 2023. And we had a conversation, you know, when we were, when I was growing up and when I started in this industry, one of the things that uh, I was made to realize, and I didn't, I guess I just knew it instinctively though, was that our, our customer base, the industry, the community, whatever, it was rather small, kind of a niche, uh, but we had extreme brand loyalty in the customer. You know, there, there were guys that grew up you know, their, their grandpappy taught them to shoot a fill in the blank, right? Mossberg, Remington, Winchester, whatever. And so when they came of age, they're like, it was the Winchester was good enough for my grandfather. It's good enough for my dad. It's good enough for me. I'm going to be a Winchester guy. And when I take my kids and teach them, they're going to, you know, and so on and so forth. And in our industry, we bred uh, very deliberately extreme brand loyalty you know there are people that were second third fourth generation remington guys or or whatever um and if you think about it charlie if we go all the way back there was primarily one mode or method that the industry had to reach people it was periodicals 
you know, magazines and may, you know, before we got all squirrely as a nation and got all afraid of guns, you know, your, your Ivor Johnson and Remington, they could run an ad in the back of the Sunday paper and it was okay. And people wouldn't cry and, you know, wet their pampers. Uh, so that was, that was pretty standard. And then what happened? We had the internet and the wheels fell off and, and everything just became hit and miss and I think that's really where we started to lose that hardcore brand loyalty and things started getting mixed up. Would you say that's fair? I'd say that's a reasonable uh, assumption or, or observation. <clears throat> you know, I think in, in between, there's a lot of things going on that, that created um, less brand loyalty and less. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people that hide behind the keyboard and just stir things up now. Mm -hmm. just because they can. Yeah, that's something that we didn't have to deal with in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, was, you know, if you were the editor of a magazine, you might go through the letter to the editor file, but that's as far as it got, you know. Uh, and, and I know there were some editors, and I'm sure you knew these guys, that, that uh, would go through the stack and find just the most ridiculous letter to the editor, and they're like, oh, I'm going to publish this. And this is right. Be Just because it's, it's so, it's so ridiculous and off the chart that people will talk about it and it'll grab. And, and then uh, I've heard tell that some letters to the editor were written by the editorial staff. <laughs> 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 I cannot well, that's one way to communicate. <laughs> I cannot confirm or deny that, but, uh, uh, yeah, but that's where as that's as far as it went. So, you know, if, if you, you know, decided that, that I hate the Mossberg one, two, three, four, and it's terrible and blah, 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 blah. It's like, great. Um, and tell all your friends, you know, your, tell your three friends and your family members that are still talking to you. And then that's it. Uh, and then we, but then we decided to give, you know, it's like er, someone who is it said, Jared, that, that, that there's always been, been idiots in the world, but up till the internet, we didn't have to listen to them or we didn't have to hear from them or something along those lines. Yeah. It was, I don't remember who said that, but you and I, I think it was you and I were having this conversation the other day about uh, firearms training in specific because the, the, the guys that built and founded the modern uh, tr firearms training schools and, and tactics schools, we were wondering, it's like, well, how did they deal with, the the kind of feedback that we get nowadays and the the answer that we came to was they probably didn't they didn't <laughs> the, the people that had something to say and an opinion on the tactics that were being taught and if they disagreed with it or agreed with it they had to show up to the class to tell the instructor what they thought so they at least got a little dose of the instruction before they were uh before they you know found their cojones and said hey I, you know i don't agree with this because blah 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 and but that means that they had to spin their ducats to get in front of that person and say those things and so the best way i found to deal with it uh, if, if you're listening and you're a firearms instructor or an instructor of any sort <clears throat> is to just ignore the the things on the internet listen to the people that show up to your classes ignore the internet um, now there's obviously exceptions if a, somebody else that is a respected instructor is giving you advice on the internet. You probably want to listen to it, but the, and, and I have this, the type of personality that it's really hard for me to ignore the uh, comments and whatnot, because part of my job is to make sure that the customers, uh, what we're saying and what we're doing, what we're displaying on media is landing the correct way, right? So the, the sender is sending the message in a way that the receiver can receive it. And but there's it's there's like a point of no return once you once you get so far down the comment rabbit hole it's like just shut it off get away from it and then do your thing that you do every day well well sometimes right. you have yeah. to put up a, an a-hole filter to, <laughs> we, we've got one it's blue so you can catch them i get that a lot here too you know i get uh i i, I like to try to engage customers because that's my background you know i we I'm a talker. I like to engage people. I like to hear what they had to say, even if it's negative. Um, and, and 
the younger people in my office are like, stop, don't, don't do that. Don't stop. Just stop, stop. You know, and I'm like, no, but, 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 yeah. and, and, you know, I, I hear that all the time, you know, but I feel like I make headway sometimes with, with some of the people, you know, they, they uh, look at things sometimes from, from the wrong viewpoint. And, um, uh, I like to try to, at least I think, um, I like to instill my wisdom a little bit on them and, and get them straight a little bit. Um, so maybe next time they won't be so, so far, um, to the side. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's one of the reasons why we can, like to do right? consumer shows, you know, because the internet is this giant bucket that everybody gets their, their, whatever they want to say in. But mm -hmm. when you go to consumer shows, you get a lot of really good feedback from real customers that yeah. like Jared said, they paid the nickel to get in you know, NRA show, um, great American outdoor show, you know, those type of shows they paid to get in. They're interested, they're engaged. They're not just keyboard warriors, you know, and, uh, that, that's a really important thing for our industry to keep in mind as we go forward is, you know, we need to c listen to our customers, the real customers. Yeah. yeah. And that, I, that is the, you know, the, um, James used to deal with that all the time. Jaeger, you know, people are like, derp derp and i and after watching your video i decided that i'm never going to come train with you it's like mother lover you are never going to come train with me ever right you know it's like you've lost a customer you never were a customer but okay that's one of the things that in in the business world we talk about customers being right and whatnot and and people um that sell products sometimes they take that to the extreme and they say well, the customer is always right. And what they're actually saying is that the prospect that's never purchased from them is always right. And that's not true. The customer that is a loyal customer to you, they're probably somebody that you should listen to. Sometimes they're not right. You have to educate them a little bit more, um, but they're right more often than the prospect would be. And in fact, if you're a business owner, the customer is your only boss. Yeah, that's true. Very but, true. But the customer is is the person who invested in you, yes. not the guy sitting in his mom's basement in a beanbag chair. Yeah, it's uh, a two-way street. Yeah. Yep. Very true. So speaking of customers, where are they? <laughs> <clears throat> I have a few theories about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I uh, we were all crazy busy during pre-COVID and COVID, you know, that that three-year stretch and we were actually as an industry running very hard before covid for five or six years i think um, most most of the uh, of the other industry people will agree with that and you know we had a great uh increase of customer or well potential customers with a lot of time on their hands and a lot of them got free money so they bought ahead during covid um i think the the whole firearms industry in, in general, sold a lot of firearms ahead that we would be selling now, mm -hmm. and this would be a normal time period. Um, I think we sold a lot of uh, pre-sales during that COVID period that, that we're kind of paying for now, in, in my opinion. Um, I'm not sure. You talked to a lot of other industry people. What what do they say about that? Yeah, it was – it. what we had was unnatural. It, it was not a, a – you know, most industries have natural progression – you know, as, as time goes by, people become aware of, you know, the brand or the company or whatever, and then they get interested in it and so forth. And they have this natural, this natural progression. And what we've been dealing with, you know, especially since Comrade Barry was in, is unnatural. You know, these, these panic spikes. And you can't run or, or a business. You can't have a business model or a plan. I don't believe so. I mean, if somebody knows how to do it on panic spikes, right, on emotion, uh, and people's emotions are up and down and up and down and up and down, and when your business model is tied to that emotional roller coster, that's not a, that's not a, a uh, um, model for success, shall we say, and, and, you know, Charlie, we talked, that it used to be in the firearms industry, it was, it, we had these predictable sales models, you know, like, okay, we know that going into Christmas, things are going to spike, and, you know, the hunting season, people are going to buy this, 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 and people right. get guns and, and stuff for Christmas, and then we go into show season, and, you know, and then the middle of the summer is always dead, because people are up playing baseball, or fishing, or whatever, uh, but it comes back up, and we, and, 
you know, with, with your an ammunition manufacturer. You know, I had somebody say the other day, they're like, how come such and such isn't making ammo? And I'm like, they have production schedules. They don't just shut off the machine and, you know, make what, your favorite caliber. You know, they, they have production schedules. They're like, okay, we'll be making blank in november that's the production schedule for that uh, and they don't wake up that day and say hey guys i think we need to make 22 today what should we right. make let's, wait a minute let's test the wind here oh yeah. it's coming from this way Some, oh, someone this go way. on facebook and find out what what that guy wants us to make yeah. you know very true you know how come you're not yeah. making 340 craig it's like <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> actually, we made ten rounds of it. Yeah, there's there's, there's there's three boxes on the shelf over there. Go buy them. Yep. Um, and and it's funny, Charlie. You know, we we were talking before we turned uh, this on about you know things that you and I grew up with, and we would never like, for instance, thirty eight special. You know, when when I was you know, in my twenties or whatever, early thirties, and people were like, what should I get? Or you know, I want to get a handgun, and I'm like, just get a, a good thirty eight. Now, if if I said to someone, just get a good thirty eight, they'd be like, "What? Right? Why? What? What is those? Are those like cowboy guns or something? You want me to get one of those cowboy guns? Uh, because you know, in the nineties, the least expensive, most readily available handgun ammo was if it wasn't twenty two. I mean, it was thirty eight, right? Not even close today. Compare a new box of thirty eight to a new box of nine mil. Uh, and you're like, wow, what, what is in this stuff? You know, I look at it and I was like, it's just 38 special, right? There's like nothing like not depleted uranium or anything. It's like, wow. Yeah. It's double the price of mines typically. Yeah. Why is it $10 a box more than nine millimeter is? Well, because that's the way the world is and things have changed. Yep. Very true. Uh, you know, I remember when, you know, you could get a, a Lee Enfield, you get a jungle carbine. In the two to three hundred dollar range, that ship has sailed and it's over the horizon. I looked the other day. Same thing with the Nagants. Yeah, Nagants, like a hundred bucks, you know, back in the day. And- Nagants are in the eight, eight, eight seven, eight hundred dollar range now. For real? Yeah, Man, for real. I haven't looked in a minute. Well, it's like the SKS, dude. If of course I, I, you know, I was young and had kids, so it wasn't like I was sitting on a pile of surplus money when that was going on. Uh, but you know, everyone's like, dude, if I would have known, but there, there were some people, I, I didn't know some people. I knew a guy who's like, yeah, I just went and bought one and, and they were selling like a spam can of seven, six, two and an SKS $199 out the door, that kind of stuff. And he's yep. like, well, I figured that's a good deal. I'll just buy it and put it in the closet and, and back in the good and, days and, and I'll just have it. Well, but uh, you, it's the it's the whole we are living in the good old days, so you, you just do it right now. Uh, and I guess that's the advice that I would give to people uh, is if you want something and it's available, and, and, and I'm, I'm not telling you to like get a second mortgage in your house, but in, in our industry, if you want something and it's available now, and you say, well, someday I'll get one of those or in the future or something like that, Mm, you probably won't like look at charlie you i you remember i know going into gun shops and they had barrels wooden barrels with m1 carbines in them yeah and, and the yep. customer would just Very like common. sort through one and figure out find the one that they wanted for 99 bucks or what have you yes those are all all of those guns are now collector's items and they started about 13 to 1500 bucks and this is when you say what, and say yes, yeah, say what. Oh, uh, I, I was that guy. You know, I was like, oh, I'd like to have one of those, but I don't need one right now, so I'm all right. Uh, I am glad that I did pick up some stuff though. Um, and and it's funny you go through certain certain items. You're like, wow, I I thought that was very common, and now they're unobtainium. You know, being an importer and being a person who's dealt had to deal with imports. You know, in I think we got super spoiled around the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and all the former Soviet states, the Romanias and Bulgarias, they all had they were cash starved. But what did they have? They, they had, had product. Baby. They had warehouses they had a lot of product full of Cold War rifles and ammo and all kinds of stuff. And you, if you 
uh, like, did you know Steve Cahaya from Century? Their oh, buyer, yeah, yeah. Machine yeah. Gun Steve. So yeah. you're Machine Gun Steve, and and you've got fistful of American dollars, and and you land in the former Yugoslavia, and you go meet a general, and he's like, "Hey, what do you got?" And he's like, "You got money?" He's like, "Cause I got everything." Yep. Right. And and people said, you know, they said, "How can we?" How could you sell $99 SKSs or $99 Nagants or whatever? How could you do that and still make money? Because the American dollar overseas was very powerful. And so they could do, everybody was making money, and the American gun buyer was getting screaming deals that were, quite frankly, unnatural. The deals very were true. And, and, but those days have, they're gone. How much surplus ammo is coming into the country now, Charlie? Very little, if any. Um, most all the European countries are are pretty much either either out of of their surplus ammo, or they've redirected it to the hot spots over there that that may need it. Um, there is there is very little uh, surplus ammo setting available. Uh, there may be some setting over there, but there it's it's very little available now um, nowadays, and very unlikely that you'll import it for a deal because. Uh, circling back to the internet, you know, our European friends now can check what the prices are going for in the U S and, and they use that as a, as a commodity read and base their prices, um, on that many times. Yeah. So and, the- and when you, you said warehouses, I don't think most people understand what you're talking about there. Uh, Paul's talking about warehouses that would make Amazon warehouses look like, look like your local hardware store. You know, these are 40, 50 acres under roof full of ammo to the ceiling or full of X, Y, Z to the ceiling. Uh, just uh, unbelievable. And they had so much surplus that they used to put it in caves over there. There were caves full of ammo and guns everywhere. <laughs> Somewhere that's <laughs> unbelievable. Exists. There's going to be people digging in the future. Like, oh. what is this? <laughs> it, 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 it brings a tear to my eye thinking about it. Like, well, you know what we have right now in the United States is we have spread out throughout the whole country. We have little individual caves because let's face it, Charlie, when, 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 when the, how many SKSs came in in the late nineties, early two thousand, like it had to have been over a million. Oh, it was millions. It, millions, right? I know one importer in particular that was over three or 4 million that he brought in. So it was those guns. The, the the few of them that were you know that weren't turned into the 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 Philadelphia gun buyback program or something like that right but most of those guns are there they're here yeah yeah they're, they're still out there they're in America yeah. they're in closets and gun safes and 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 under people's beds or whatever but they're yep. out there in America it's like J frames uh, about jeez I don't know 10 15 years ago I needed to do an article and the article was going to be about like um it was going to like upgrading your J frame right so I tried to go to a you know to the local gun shops and pawn shops and stuff and buy a, a used J frame that I could put a new finish on and new grips and stuff like that couldn't find one and I was talking to a buddy of mine. He goes, yeah, of course you can't find them. He goes, because they're in sock drawers and on closet shelves all over America and nobody gets rid of them. You know, they, they're just there. They're that gun that's always there. Uh, so, and I, I believe what we have right now uh, in is, and people don't feel the need to sell them or they don't want to sell them. They're like, eh, and I should hang on to that or, or what have you. So, and if you go to, you know, I went to a gun show, which I hardly ever go to anymore. Uh, but I went to a gun show in February and there were dudes that like had surplus SKS is for six ninety nine, like bro. And the thing is, how do you sell a surplus SKS for six ninety nine when in today's market you can buy a brand new black rifle for six ninety nine? Four and a quarter. Yeah. 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 No. You know. So it, it's a, it's a strange, strange world that we're living in. Now, going getting back to the brand loyalty, do you think there's any way we can, as an industry, come back to that? I, I think I think all brands have loyal customers. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, 
our market is very diluted now because we have, and, and not, not necessarily a bad thing, but we've had a lot of uh, a lot of imports coming in over the last eight or ten years, um, in a lot of different configurations. Um, I, I think the customer, when they buy a firearm, they buy it now for instead of like when we were growing up, you know, hey, you know, that's a bucket of M, uh, M1s, you know, I'm going to buy one because I've got 60 bucks, you know, in my pocket. Um, I think our consumers are now buying firearms um, for a more like specific point. Um, you know, we still have customers out there that that just are gun aficionados and they just love to buy and sell and trade. But um, the, the customers that are out there, I think, are buying either for self-defense or they want to punch holes in paper. Um, the hunting market is pretty slow, I think. Um, if you look at bolt action guns and shotguns, that that has taken a dip over the last few years. Um, although in COVID, we had a great resurgence of hunting license sales, which was great because um, that meant new guns being sold. Mm -hmm. But I think our customers now are, are more um, um, project specific than they used to be. Yeah, it's That's I, an interesting change. I didn't think to bring up the hunting you, thing, but oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I've been paying attention for a long time. And, you know, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, the, the 4-H shooting sports and, uh, and NRA's youth programs and what have you, uh, they, they were trying to push the, well, they did the firearms or the hunter safety classes. And they're trying to get new kids and get 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds into the hunter safety and so <clears> forth. Uh, but we would have you know, a camp with 200 kids in it, 204H kids, and they were there for shooting sports. And they would offer the hunter safety. You just had to sign up for it before you came to camp, and they would send you your material. And then when you came, they would do the in-person testing. And on average, out of a, a camp of 200, we'd have about five, six <laughs> teenagers kids, you know, 13 year olds, 12 year olds or whatever that had signed up for the hunter safety program. Uh, and you say, well, that's good. You had five, you know, it's like, yeah, well we had five, but we had five out of 200. Yeah. So, you know, what is, what is that telling you? And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit frustrated as an adult because quite frankly, every year, even, you know, even places like you, that you think are free or what are like Wyoming, Every year they come up with new regulations and they change the they change the zones. You know, they you know, they divide the state into like 182 freaking zones, and you can only hunt. You can choose two zones to hunt in, and blah, 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 all that. And they're they're not making it easier. You know, because any government agency once they start getting money for something, they're not going to change their minds and either make it less expensive or make it easier and that but at the same time you the, you've got the representatives from the wild you know the state wildlife whatever and they're like oh we need to get new hunters into the field and every year they do like you know take a kid hunting ba 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 it's like yeah but you jerks every year you change the regs you do this you do that you send the freaking bambi nazis out into the woods and they're like uh, if you don't have a derp 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 i'm going to fine you and i like, i got my ticket book here and it's like why, why would people want to participate in that, especially a new person? Now, if you're an older person, that's something I found in uh, the Western states. If you've been doing it for a long time and you know how to work the system, or I'm not trying to say game the system, I'm just like, you know, well, you have to do this, 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 this. And uh, But if you're new, if you're brand new and someone says, oh, you want to go out and do that? Well, here's a list of the regulations and the things that you have to, you have to figure all this out. And if you're wrong... So the the guy in the green tacky uniform is going to come and he's going to find you or take your gun or you know it's like do I really want to do that? Yeah, they definitely have made it um, more difficult to get involved in in hunting um, primarily. Yeah, um, and I think that's just the introduction of of big government in our in our uh, in our state lands a lot of times. Yeah, they they um, convince people that you have to get, you know, permission from the king. It's the, it's the whole king's deer thing, you know. But it's, it's not, it, it, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a maze, but you can get through it. 
And, and, you know, uh, we have to continue to encourage, like you said, our, our older customers, our older shooters, our older, older hunters, um, to, to, to grab somebody and go and introduce somebody to that, to that area and help walk them through that process. Um, it's really important for the, for the future of our, of our sport that, um, the more mature, uh, people in our sport, uh, do that, you know, and, and we continue to support the people that are doing that in, in any way we can. That's one thing that, um, I've thought's been killing our culture for quite a while is the, and I don't know, maybe this is purposeful from the, the big government end, but you see the people that, that are the more mature people that have done this for a long time. And as it gets more difficult to do the thing, even though they know the process, they're like, well, this is something else that I don't want to have to deal with. So they don't go teach the next generation. Well, then that's how information gets lost. And there's a verse in the Bible that says something like, Hey, I'm going to give you all these things, but you should not forget how you got them. And the only way for that not to happen for, for generation four or five to remember how that happened, how the culture was established is for the mature people to pass it down to the next generation with as much detailed information as possible. Now, one of the frustrations from the mature people is probably that the younger people don't listen as well as they should. And I I was for sure a culprit of that in my younger years. You know, the older I get, the smarter my parents get, or maybe they're that smart the whole time. I don't know, man, but it's, uh, so, so it's a balancing game. It's like, as the, the mature individual, how do you pass down this information? And at what age or uh, time frame in that young person's life is the right time to do it. Uh, man, cause there are things that my grandpa tried to teach me when I was a teenager and I was too busy thinking about girls or whatever that now I'm like, man, I really wish I would have sat down and just listened and learned from him. That, and, and then he's passed on since. So I can't do that, but like, that's man, why you got to get hello. kids when they're like 10. <laughs> that that's, you know, that's when they're, they're you know, a 10 year old kid, 11 year old kid, um, before they get in, you know, before they they get still think you're amazing and you know and stuff. everything. Yeah, you get them. And, right, yeah, you're still the king of the world to them. Yeah. But they'll come back eventually. You'll lose them for a few years, but they'll come back. You'll lose them for a few years. But. Yeah. So yeah, in our, we, we're, we've got a lot of challenges, and I don't know if other industries do that, whether automotive industries or, or whatever. Um, if they sit down with each other, uh, you know, the people that are in the industries and say, okay, we have challenges how are we going to meet these challenges? You know, for instance, we used to have a very predictable sales model and production model and so forth that used to be very predictable. Now it's not, it's out the window, you know, uh, can we come back to that? You know, or we, or, you know, what are we going to do? And, and I, I hear a lot from our, you know, the industry about, Oh, you know, what should we do? You know? And, and I, I kind of feel bad for them for, to a certain extent, because, Friends, we talked about periodicals and magazines for 30, 50, I don't know, 100 years. Uh, it was very, this is what you did, okay? You, you, you know, in the United States, when I started writing for paper magazines, there was probably six or seven editors that were in charge of all of the gun magazines. So if you're a marketing guy, you needed to know seven people, Right. That's it. You just needed to know and have the phone number for seven people. The guy who was in charge of Harris, the guy who's in charge of NRA pubs, the guy who's in charge of, you know, guns and ammo pubs, you know, and then throw a couple other ones in, Peterson's and whatever, Peterson's and whatever they are now. Uh, but you, that's all you needed. You, you needed to know seven people or so. And now, you know, that's, that's dead. Uh, and now you have influencers and youtubers and blah, 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 right and uh, so you get marketing people they're like there's literally thousands of people trying to get my attention and convince me that they are the way to go uh and so i and i kind of feel bad for them uh, in, uh, in a certain aspect but it also i don't because it's their job to know so um i don't know how we do we you, there's so much noise out there i i guess that you know there's so much noise and how do you tune out that noise and how do you figure out like i'm not here 
as student of the gun and Paul Markle and what I do, I, and I never really have been, uh, when I was writing articles, I wasn't there when I had the TV show. wasn't I wasn't trying to sell your products. I'm trying to make people aware of your company, right? I'm trying to generate brand loyalty. That's what I'm doing, you know. Um, and I think sometimes what we have is a lot of these young people, and I say young, I'm like 30 and under, uh, who went to college and then they got a marketing degree or whatever, and they believe that the job of the radio show, TV show, magazine, whatever, is to sell your products. That's not my job. My job is not to sell your product. My job is to make sure that the audience knows your product exists and to talk about your product. That's what I do. Uh, and we talked about the, you know, they're like quantifying. They want numbers. They want clicks or impressions or, or whatever. But, you know, I say, well, how many impressions does that billboard get on Highway 40? Like, what do you mean? How many impressions did it get? You know, you know, back in the old days with magazines, you know, you buy, a, you know, a, a one quarter page ad on page 84 or whatever. And it's like, how many times was that clicked on? <laughs> well, I think our, our advertising slash marketing people nowadays are so, so caught up in quantifying qualifiable and quantifiable numbers that they that they forget the branding component uh, that's out there that has to be told like you're saying you know you introduce people to products give them the the specs take it out shoot it do a video you know talk about the great things and maybe a couple of the, the not so great things let the customer decide if that's an interesting thing for them um, a lot a lot of the new people we have in marketing uh, you know uh, th that's an in untan intangible that you provide, you know, they're all, they're hung up on tangibles, which is a, a really good thing. And I think our, our industry should embrace that, but there's more depth that has to be done other than just click numbers, time spent on websites. And that's good information to have as a manufacturer slash marketer. But, you know, we, we do need to also have some entertainment too in in the in the whole scope of things because we do this because we enjoy it and yeah. it's a hobby and it's fun and you know that's why we that's why we're here uh it, it's just a uh, an added benefit that we can pay the bills by by doing what we do right uh, <laughs> but and we didn't I've even talk about communicating this. with yeah. uh, marketing people for quite a while in the industry and from from my perspective one thing that's changed quite a bit is that the the mark the person that's in charge of marketing they have to report to somebody, right? So they have to take their their numbers that they've got and they have to send it up the chain to whoever their boss is and then maybe their boss's boss or whatever. So what they're doing is they're just trying to find the best way to make it look like they're doing their job in a way that provides ROI for the company. And so it's it's one of the, I have to be very empathetic with the marketing people because it's like, it, it, in one aspect, a lot of them know and understand. It's like, hey, we have to do a, a multiple, we have to have an omni-channel marketing strategy, right? And But they also have to show that ROI, especially with a new person that's in a company, because if you don't, then you're you're going to lose your job. They're going to find somebody else because there's there's a it's it's not slim pickings anymore for people that now it is slim pickings for people that know marketing and know the industry because the industry is relatively small. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's probably bigger than when you guys were were coming up and building the industry because that's really what you you Charlie and and Dad you guys did is you're kind of the founders of the modern version of the firearms industry. Uh, you you took it from an offline industry to an online industry, which is a a massive feat to accomplish. And and kind of you're maybe you're reaping the rewards or. Uh, dealing with the problems, right, that came up in that process, right? Because you can't predict everything from uh, hindsight being 2020. You can't predict everything before it happens. But uh, I think it's just an interesting thing from from the marketer's perspective. It's like, yeah, we we have all these channels and all this noise, like you said. Well, what do we focus on? The best thing is to show this ROI so I can make sure I keep my job. And um, that's my experience. That's what I've experienced with speaking with the marketing people. But 
going back to the customer and the prospect or the eyes, like for instance, uh, I, I know, I don't know much about this, but, but Zach, my youngest son, he has a, you know, TikTok channels and outside of the firearms industry and he does stuff. And you say, you have to say, okay, so TikTok. Yeah. And, and you know, the, your marketing, you're like, oh, TikTok and millions and millions of viewers. Like, okay, cool. That's cool. Um, how many of those are overseas? How many of those are 14 year olds? You know, you say, well, this video got 1 million views on TikTok. Cool. How many of those 1 million views are humans who could actually purchase a gun? Five? Some some subset of that. Yeah. 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 yeah it's okay. like, and it's like, so all these South Korean teenagers watch this video. Like, whoopity doo. What is, what's the gun market in South Korea? You know, um, or Japan, you know, Japanese. And, and it's like, because that gun is also a gun that's featured in modern metal warfare call of whatever, you know. And so they're all excited about it and they, and they, they see it and they watch it. And you're like, yay, look at me. I got, we got a million, a million views of this TikTok video. Yeah. Three quarters of a million of those were in Korea and Japan where they're not going to buy. They will never buy a gun from us or anything. So is that you, we, sometimes you need a little bit of a reality break. Like, you know, I can show you a million view TikTok, and then we'll, let's do the analytics. Yep. And you know, 75% of those were overseas in, in Korea and Japan. It's like those aren't customers. And that's nice that they saw that, but that, that kid, that 13 year old in Japan, you're like, well, man, that 13 year old Japan, he'll grow up and then he'll be a, no, he won't. He's never going to be a customer. He, and unless he gets a passport and he comes to the United States and becomes a citizen, he's never going to be a customer. It's not like in the United States, if you reach a 13 year old or a 14 year old with your Mossberg or your Remington or your whatever logo, if you give that 14 year old a Remington hat, someday that 14 year old will be a grown adult with money and he's going to be an American citizen. He can buy a Remington. So, you know, there's a lot of these things like, oh, how many Instagram followers you have? And Charlie, we talked about this is like the, what would I don't know how what what number do you want? Because quite frankly, tomorrow morning, if you're in the gun industry or even the fringe of the gun industry, you could have 50,000 Instagram followers wake up tomorrow and your channel's gone because, you know, they decided or YouTube decided to throttle you, or Google decided to throttle you. So, you know, we've got these marketing people like, yeah, you got, I need your Instagram numbers, I need your YouTube numbers, I need your Facebook numbers, you know, if you're a grandpa, you need Facebook numbers. And you're like, grandpa. Yeah, yeah, but like, but you understand, bro, that, that all of those entities are completely hostile to our industry. And I think that's a, a point that that yeah, it's a very good point, good observation, Paul. I mean, we have uh, as a as an industry, we have to we have to embrace the social media aspect and the the power of it. But most people have no idea how limited we are and how quickly we can be shut down on social media <clears throat> for simple as something as simple as as saying you know available now. Yeah. In our, in our social selling, media posts, you're selling, you're guns selling on firearms. My platform, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, you're yeah. selling guns on the or, internet. It's like, or or go to your local gun shop. You know, um, that means I endorse uh, a legal sale, uh, a local business, a distribu a distributor. You know, but they feel like if we say go to a local gun shop, we're trying to sell guns. You know, we're just trying to tell people where they can go look at our product. How is that and, illegal? And they pull us down. They yeah. pull us down off the, you know, I mean, it's, it's their world, you know, which, which, you know, something that Paul and I talked about last week, which is as an industry, I don't understand why we don't have our own social media, complete social media package uh, run and, and, and controlled by, by, you know, two A's out I, there. I can tell you why um, <laughs> I'm involved in a, a video platform that's very similar to YouTube, but it's for. Uh, it do, it doesn't have the, all the bells and whistles of YouTube because, quite frankly, the industry doesn't support us enough to have YouTube ducats, right? And Agreed. to make those things and make it as easy as YouTube, you have to put in. Uh, I mean, G Google bought YouTube in 2008, 
and it took them 10 years to get the thing profitable. So there's a lot of cash being dumped into these things. Yeah. But uh, I, I digress a little bit there and, and kind of venting a little bit. But the, the reason is, I believe, is because of habits are hard to change. And there's most people already have a habit of when they want to watch a video, they're they're going to go to YouTube because they've they've been doing it for so long. And 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 you can back that out and look at the content creator habits as well. It's like, well, we've already created this habit for content creators, right? We at Student of the Gun have been creating content for holy cow, almost what fifteen years now, something like and, that. Yeah, it's crazy. Long time. And, and the you know the mediums have changed along the way. But the the majority of that has been digital media production. And so we've created the habit of going to uh, certain channels to, for certain things. So like you've got YouTube for uh, what I call top of the funnel audience. And then you can maybe use like Vimeo or something like that for a, a lower, a middle to the bottom of the funnel audience where you actually want to have some conversion because there's a little bit less restrictions, but they still are not open and, and industry friendly. And, and that's one reason I got involved in the company. Juxi uh, used to be full 30. And uh, so we partnered with a, another company and it's Juxi.com. And what, what it is, is it, it's owned by people that love and are involved actively in this industry. And, and we've collectively, we've spent quite a bit of money of our, of our own ducats putting this thing together and making it live so that we can then serve the industry. And it doesn't even start like serving the industry doesn't even start until you have the minimum viable product that works. Right. right. And uh, so, so that's, you know, that's kind of my, my long diatribe about why people, why the industry doesn't have their own stuff because of habits, the people, the customers in the industry have a habit of going to these places and it's difficult to get them off. It just takes time. Right. It, it, it takes, takes a long time and a lot of money. Yeah, it takes a long time and a lot yeah. of money to to get somebody to to say, "Hey, I'm going to go purposefully to juxy.com to search for these firearms videos instead of just going to YouTube." Yep. And and then I think that'll probably continue to happen as long as YouTube allows firearm content. And I and agree. I'm saying, you know, it, some people are they have the um the values portion of it where they're like, "I'm just going to can my YouTube channel." And that's great. You can do that fine. Uh, if you don't want to do that and you still want to use YouTube as like a top of the funnel, like let's get the biggest audience I can there so that I can then send that audience to another place where I own the audience, then do that too. That's a fantastic strategy. So it's it's not an either door, either or it's in in addition to. Absolutely. It has to be a mix of, of both until, I mean, it's, this is a 10 year look ahead, you know, strategic 10 year look ahead that you're talking yeah. about. And, you know, uh, Juxi is a very good example of that. And we have to support those people that are that are doing that uh, as an industry, as in individuals too, by going and consuming the content on places uh, like that. You know, it's yeah. it's it's a long time with a lot of money put in, and probably not a lot of money made by the people that that run it. But again, you know, you got the value thing behind it, and uh, we have to keep supporting them. Yep. Yeah, it's the the uh, supporting our own culture first is very exactly. important. Because yep. this culture, this industry is the culture of America. It's what built the country and it's, it's what founded the country. It's what built the country into what it is now, like it or, or hate it. Right. And well, if you hate it, you can leave, but yeah. if you like it, you can stay. No, I'm going this, to Canada. This culture if, is the industry. If Trump gets elected, I'm going to Canada. And I, I would actually just quick right turn here. I want, I want to see the statistics of the, the Hollywood celebrities or the faux celebrities or whatever who swore in 2016 that they were going to move to Canada if Trump got elected. How many did and did one? I don't think even one did. And, of course, uh, Canada is like, well, you're going to do what now? No, we don't want you. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, you, when it, we... And, and it's, it's, it's frustrating because a lot of our industry, our industry now, uh, they're hiring these fresh out of, I don't know, um, Berkeley or Stanford or whatever. They're hiring these professional marketing people. And these professional marketing people went to school and they learned all about, you know, socialist media and so on and so forth. And then we say, yeah, Juxi.com. They're like, what? 
that's not even a thing. We don't even, we're not going to, we're not going to invest in that. We're not going to do that because I learned, this is what I learned. I learned YouTube, Instagram, Google. I you now, learned, what they do understand is top, middle and bottom of the funnel. Yeah. So if, <clears throat> but you know, do you think that they would get on it because, but right. You know, like Jared said, until YouTube and see YouTube is kind of like the arson death by arsenic poisoning. You know, they, they don't kill you immediately. It's a slow death. Uh, Cause if all of a sudden YouTube just nothing about firearms, everything's gone. Boom. Then people would scramble. They would panic and they scramble and they're like, we need some place to put our, it's like uh was it silencer co or silencer what was the sound? They got they, yeah. The other channel got canned. Their like whole ago entire like channel, and and, uh, and all and everything was you know. And it, if all your videos are saved there and hosted there and so forth, and then they're gone, just you've got to you know re-upload and you've got to find this. You know, uh, why are we? Why as an industry are we waiting? We're like, well, they haven't. Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of like an uh, like an like an abused woman. Or it's like, well, I haven't. I didn't get a beating this week, so you know, good job. You know, and, and we're just, that's what we are. We're like an abused spouse. We're, as an industry, we're just like, oh, I, I or I, I hope they don't notice me. You know, if we got to be careful, because if we say a certain thing or do a certain thing, then they'll notice us, and if that, they notice us, then we is, get a beating. Well, that's something that's that I'm, not how to live. Yeah, it, as a a creator and somebody that is um, I have a lot of friends that are content creators and this is something I'm very passionate about because it annoys the crap out of me when when a content creator that's producing firearms content has to change the way that they're going to deliver information because of the platform that's that they're publishing on so maybe they want to talk about a piece of the gun that they really they loved but they can't because if they take that thing apart and put it back together then their video is going to get removed or if they take they literally unscrew a silencer from the front of the gun and then put it back on to show an user like, Hey, this is the ease of connection here. Then, then their, their content's going to get removed. So what's happening is content creators are now self-censoring themselves because they're worried that the, you know, their audience is going to be limited based upon the actions and, and the words that they're using, which is man, just for, from a content creator's workflow, it's it's very i can't imagine the stress that it, it creates for a lot of people and it's one thing that i'm very passionate about because i want a content creator to be able to jump on the camera with the thing that they're talking about and just talk about it give their honest feedback about everything that they've that they've done with that item because that's what they're there for that's their that's the reason that they're producing that video and that's their passion is to talk about that thing and like Charlie said earlier, it's like, man, if you can make a living doing something that you love, then that is living the good life. And it's, man, it's come, if you're a content creator, come to jukesy.com right now. You can import your videos from YouTube. So while they're still on YouTube, create an account on Juxy, import, just put your channel URL in the import um, box, hit import, and it'll pull all of your videos over to Juxy. Please go do that. Highly recommended from a marketing standpoint. Um, it's it, you know we have to be aware every day of what we're putting out there, and worried every night about you know getting getting it taken off or or getting uh, you know the hatchet from them. Um, it, this is really a us or them situation, and but they control right now you know how we get information out. So when we have platforms like Juxi and, and others out there. You know, we need to support them. And like Jared said, if you can move your content over now, why risk the possibility of losing it? Yeah, for sure. Wow. We've so been going almost an hour. <laughs> I've got a question for Charlie in regards to uh, marketing degrees and whatnot. If you have some time, Charlie. Yeah, I'm wide open. How have you seen, have you seen a difference in the, the quality of, um, people that come out of college now versus when you were in? Oh, maybe not the quality. Um, a couple of things I've noticed. Here's my observations. Uh, the young people are much, much smarter 
than Paul and I were when we come out of school, whatever, whatever school you went to, whether it was a school of hard knocks, you know, you know, U.S. military college, whatever, they're much, much smarter because they've had so much information available to them for so long. Um, young people are, are, uh, they've got my total respect. Uh, I've got a lot, uh, all companies I know that are flourishing are, are accepting them and getting them into positions in their company because you're much smarter than we were and it scares the hell out of us, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, it, on the other side, it's much harder to find somebody that, um, really embraces the firearms culture and can, can, can mesh that as a, as a cog in the wheel and, and be productive with it. Um, that's the challenge I think to, to most, uh, manufacturers slash marketers or marketing companies is finding that smart person with passion. Um, it's, it's difficult. Um, I, I think that might've answered part of your question anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was curious about is, you know, how, how have things changed a little bit and it's, it's hard to tell without right, going back to school in the modern age, but you can observe what comes out of the college system. And, uh, uh I'm actually going through a course right now. And I'm, it's, it's really cool because I'm in the firearms industry and I'm taking marketing business management classes. So I'm using the, the class and the reports that we have to write to write about the industry so that I'm hoping that, you know, that information will get in, in front of, cause it's not just the instructors that are reading it. The students also are reading the, the uh, material that each student writes. So, so it's kind of like one of those, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a catch 22, but uh, like a diamond in the rough, right? It's it's the using the process to educate people about our industry and the culture, and that we're not the kind of industry that is talked about on the mainstream media. We, we're we're a an industry of solid faith based people that do right just because they want to, not because they have to. And uh, the the old adage that an armed society is a polite society. It's absolutely true. Totally is. And, and, you know, uh, socially, our culture has gone through a change, as, as Paul mentioned or, or alluded to earlier. You know, we don't have as many grandparents teaching their grandchildren or children, for that matter, um, how to go hunt or why we go hunt or where that came from. Um, unfortunately, you know, now the industry has to take that into their own hands. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, youth uh, shooting sports associations out there, they need industry support like no, like no other time in the world. Um, the Collegiate Trap Shooting Association has done a fantastic job of bringing young people into our sport, at least uh, warming them up to us. Um, Camp Perry's going on right now, two and a half hours from where I sit, uh, the national matches, right? Um, in the last five years, we've seen hundreds and th thousands of youth, new youth being uh, energized into the national matches, um, which is exciting. If you go up there, you see lots of young people. And, um, you know, that's one area that that's getting some some focus, which is very important for for our industry as we move forward. Um uh, you know, not everybody now owns a firearm where, you know, 40, 50 years ago, I could almost say everybody I knew owned firearms. Um, so we have to, uh, we have to keep embracing new ways to bring people into our business. Yeah. And that was the next question I had for you is how do we, how do we help extend and educate the youth? Cause that, that's the future of this nation and the world is how do we continue to uh, educate them on and what liberty is why it's important and then the things that surround liberty right because without liberty we know it doesn't matter what widget we sell in the firearms industry it doesn't it just won't matter liberty is the basis of that and so what do you think is the the best way to go about getting that information to the next generation of people that's a difficult question because I think that our, our school systems and, and, uh, po political leaders, if you want to call them that, there's a few of them, but not many, um, have done a good job of, of, uh, villainizing, uh, the firearms business. Um, 
I think it it's it's going to be a a hard long fight, but you know it's it's nothing that we we can't lose this battle. You know, I mean, I can remember back in when I was a young child with my father and grandfather talking about the same things we talk about right now. How do we get more people interested in in what we do? You know, um, you just have to do it. Uh, you have to you have to instow. Uh, you have to teach teach him teach him history. They have to understand history and why it's important that we're Americans and and what we have that other countries don't. Um, a lot of people don't understand that. Um, and that's a difficult thing to do, uh, probably way above my mental capabilities and pay grade. But, but, you know, from my, from my, you know, small viewpoint in, in Ohio, um, we have to be very diligent on making sure people understand our history. You, you know, that self-deprivation is a sign of intelligence. So, so when you, when you do that, people know you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the you know from my perspective, and Charlie, you helped us out with this a, a lot when we were living in Ohio and uh, working with the Ohio 4-H Shooting Sports Program. They actually just had their, uh, they just you know they just had the camp, Jared. Yeah, yep. yeah, you know, that they, time of year they had the uh, the annual 4-H Shooting Sports Camp, uh, which has has trained and educated thousands and thousands of, of kids, and and it's crazy, Charlie. These these my 4-H kids are now adults with children. Yeah. Um, you know, and every once in a while I hear from, you know, from some of them. Um, but, uh, but that's how we do it. That's how we do it. And, and in, in today's world where there's so much noise and, and everything is, and everything is notional, everything is digital, everything, the, the value of the hands-on experience of the shooting sports cannot be underestimated or overstated it can't be overstated enough because we've got we've got you're competing with the xbox you're competing with the iphone you're competing with all this notional digital you know uh crap that has no basis in reality or realism you know a good friend of ours uh, scott he's always talking about returning to realism getting your young people to put hands on something, whether it's to grow a plant or to raise a chicken or to, you know, whatever, something that's actually tangible and uh, real and real. And, yeah. and, uh, that the thing that's, there's nothing much more real than the shooting sports, you know, whether the, the, I said that, you know, when you have a, a bow and an arrow and a target, the target doesn't care about your feelings or your pronouns or whatever. If, if you don't do everything you're supposed to do, as you were taught, the arrow is not going to hit the target and crying about it's not going to help. You have to make it happen, whether it's breaking the clay target flying through the air or, you know, cutting the bullseye at a hundred yards or, you know, putting the arrow where it needs to be that you have to do that. You have to apply it. You have to listen and so forth. And it's real. And if we could give, and the great man, I, I the great thing about the 4-H shooting sports camp is it's a no cell phone camp. You know, they tell them like parents take your, when you drop your kids off, take their phones. Cause if they get caught with a phone, we're going to call you. You're going to come pick them up. I'm like what? Yeah. I don't care if you live four hours away, you're going to work. They're going to sit in the office until you come and pick them up. And they're like, Oh, that's me. It's like, they don't need them. We have phones at camp. If there's an emergency, we got we have first responders. Let let these kids talk to each other. You know what I mean? Let them talk to each other. Let them engage in in actual. Can you imagine that? And I know that the, the thing is, the sad thing is, there's some parents who are like, oh, no, my, my 13-year-old has to have their phone on them. No, they don't. No, they don't. It's Take a it form away. of entertainment. It's, yeah. not, it's, not, it's not doing them any good, really, No, for the most part. This like, what if they need to get a hold of me? All right, a, they don't. But B, there's a phone. They could find an adult. If there's an emergency, we'll call you. Let the camp leaders educate the kids yeah. on what it, why hanging up the phone is a term. Because you don't do that with cell. You don't actually hang a cell phone up, right? Right. right. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like I can just imagine the kids like pushing the button. It's like, why is this called hanging up a phone? Hang up. Hang. Hang up. What? I would yeah. do that. <laughs> Whoop, hang it up. Oh man. So I, you know, I, I know that there's struggles that we have ahead of us. I think 
and I, I believe that as an industry, we got to quit chasing our tails and we have to quit reacting. Uh, I don't think it's a viable model for the future uh, to be in this reactionary mode. I know that that's natural for people are like, yeah, but right now, what are we going to do right now? And you, you can focus on the right now, but you can't just focus on the right now and ignore the future. Because if all you're focusing on is the right now, then you don't have a future. Uh, and how, you know, we need to focus on how do we regain brand loyalty? You know, do we regain brand loyalty? Is that something we want or do we, because if you don't have brand loyalty, that, then you're just, you're just chasing trends or you're chasing your tail or you're chasing shadows. You're like, you know, what can we do this week to try and outdo our, our 50 other competitors? Um, that's not, it's not a good model. Uh, so we've got, and I would hope, and, and you know, the other side you know, the, the we hate guns and guns are bad side, they have an unlimited amount of money, essentially. They have unlimited resources because the media the has just decided that, that that narrative is the correct narrative and they're going to push that narrative, that guns are bad and, and people who buy guns are bad and only the state should have guns and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they get that for free. But on our side, how do we... You know, because we're competing for the same customer. We're competing for the minds, you know, the the hearts and minds of the American people. Who do we have to compete for the hearts and minds of the American people? Uh, and it's it's a relatively small uh, cadre of of individuals compared to the other side. You know, how do we do? How do we support those people? How do we keep their voices on the radio? How do we keep their, you know, keep that message going? Uh, and, and if we don't, that, what happens? Yeah, there is a fantastic example of exactly what to do and how to do it. And you know what that example is called? No. Blacklivesmatter.com. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, it's, it's kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of joking, but not really. Because listen to this. The, the money and the funding that dad's talking about, the unlimited amount of, of, funding that is available for the the other side we'll call it is, is true but i think more importantly the being united in a cause is the real power of of the movement and if you look at what was done with the blm movement they they used emotions to gen people up and they got people to go to the website and donate well if you follow that trail the donation was done through a system called Act Blue, which publicly states that they the purpose of that system is to help fund candidates in the Democratic Party. Like, okay, it was it was all there publicly and, and it still worked really well for them to increase their funds because they're already united. So if we take that concept, agree or disagree with it. And you do something similar for the industry. And I think that as an industry, while we're smaller, I think that we're more powerful if we are united because we are based in truth and reality. And if there was something similar to, to that system in place for, for our side, then it would work just as well. We just have to get to that part of being united. And that's where the real challenge comes in because our foundational values include liberty individual liberty and and that makes it really difficult and, and while it's a fantastic value i believe it also makes it really difficult to to be more willing to be part of a group which is you know it's a catch-22 it's it's a good it's a great value that leads to the potential demise of a culture because the the thing that makes us the culture that we are is really individual liberty. And that's what our founders fought for. It's like, Hey, no, we want to be, we want to have individual liberty and the ability to do what we want to, to get a, a, um, to achieve the goals that we're, we want to achieve and to have a good life, the life that we want to live, which is fantastic. We also need to be able to unite as an industry, as a group, as a culture, whatever you want to call it. 
and, and um, help fund ourselves through being united. And then obviously, you know, the, the money is a, a, an important part as well. But I think that that's, that's an interesting thing. If you look at the way that BLM was, that whole thing shook out, then that works clearly because they, they did it and they proved that it works really well. Well, it was and, also good, based on lies. Yeah. But then that's what but they saying. got the money. Yeah. With, you know. with, with our industry based on the, the values of truth and reality plus the funding will destroy any opponent. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. You know, something that, that I've seen and, and lived through many times, you might, you might throw some, some thoughts in on this, but um, I think the, you know, like Jared was saying, the other side has done a good job of a divide and conquer thing where they put the pistol shooters against the rifle shooters. They put the upland game hunters against the deer hunters. They put the archers against the gun hunters. Um, you know, the MSR guys against the bold action guys. I mean, you know, I've been in group conversations with, with firearms people and the, the deer hunter that uses a bolt gun says, you know, I'm just not sure if we need those automatics. Mm. Well, Hey guys, this is all rights based. It's the same rights in the same fight. We're all mm. in it together. We have to be more united as a, as a, as a group and not be us and them, meaning within our own group, yeah. there's us and them. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's all about the, the, the constitution. It's all about our rights as, as, you know, people in the United States. Um, and, and, you know, we need to get back together and, and be going in the same direction all the time. Yeah. The gun is a tool. The foundation for that is, is the liberty that, that we have to that earn. We have. That's right. That's right. That's why someone who looks like this has said, that all firearms must be first and foremost viewed as instruments of liberty. And if you don't do that, then, and then everything else is just a toy. If it's not an instrument of liberty, it's a toy and it can be taken away from you. It's a privilege and can be taken away from you. Um, yeah. Liberty first, Liberty first, you know, I know there's already a Liberty mutual, but Liberty first, you know, if we could just go ahead and convince everybody in our industry to accept and adopt the principle of Liberty first, uh, we'd be better off for it. You know, you're like, well, derp, derp, this kind of, you know, it's, it's like, you know, um, years and years and years ago, I read an article about Ted Nugent and he was really, um, angry because there were, uh, traditional archery guys that were protesting against the allowing of crossbows in in hunting and then they're like that's not right and that's not fair and and he's like look you imbeciles and he said it in ted words but he's like look and you imbeciles those those guys are on our team just because it's still one stick it's is you're still only launching one stick at a time it's not like it's a full auto freaking you know gatling crossbow um, who cares? You know, maybe that guy will get into it and say, oh, that was too easy. Now I'm going to become a traditionalist or whatever. But, but the fact is, and that goes back 20 plus years, at least of, of the traditional archery people protesting against the crossbows, you know, and stuff like that. And that's just an example of us crapping on ourselves. Um, if, if somebody would have said, Hey, it's all about Liberty and whether it's a crossbow or a compound bow or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, and whether you, not you shoot three gun or trap or whatever, you know, it's like these, uh, the gun golfers, man, we, we know some of the best gun golfers in the world, but then there, but there are others like trap ranges. I'm sure, you know, Charlie, it's like you, you go to these trap ranges and they don't want to hear anything about these automatic concealed carry pistol shooting people and you know uh and, and we don't have any place we don't have places for them to shoot because we don't even like them and or whatever uh it, it's this elitism that's going to kill all of us uh if we don't get our crap together and decide that it doesn't matter whether it's an over under or parazi or a glock or whatever it's it's all about liberty that's the that's the bottom line because Paul Markle said so. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Yeah, where can and this is when we come to the point. It's like, where can we find out more about Charlie Brown? Now you can't. You don't need to. Don't don't worry about it. But uh, 
If, if there was a parting thoughts that you would want to leave with our audience, Charlie, what would they be? Hmm. Support the ones who support you, uh, you know, back, back the two a, um, support local businesses. Uh, they are your neighbors. Um, we've always been a, a, a company that supports, you know, local gun shops and, and, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to do business nowadays, but, uh, nothing beats going in and having a relationship eye to eye contact. Like we were talking about discussions. Um, you can't get that on the internet like you can face to face. So, um, you know, just keep supporting our, our cause. Amen. We have to do it. All right. Thank you very much. Charlie Brown from MKS supply, a man of many parts. Glad to be here. <laughs> All right, one more time. Thank you very much to our buddy Charlie Brown from MKS Supply uh, for joining us. I truly appreciate Charlie being here, taking the time out of his day. He's been in this industry basically his entire life, uh, and uh, he has he comes to it with a not only a unique perspective but a a seasoned perspective. You didn't just show up here. He's been paying attention to this thing as long as I have, longer than I have. So uh, we appreciate his advice. Coming up this week on Student of the Gun University podcast. Yes, indeed. It is a short form, single topic, easy to digest format. So if you're looking for a little bit more of us, me, it, uh, and you just want to like consume them one at a time, we're going to be talking about training in the heat because that's what we be doing. We'll be training in the heat. And uh, that's going to be on this week's Thursday episode of Student of the Gun University podcast. You want to talk about the uh, culture one there, Jared, before we sign off? Yeah, we need your support. And the best way for you to do that is to go to studentofthegun.com slash culture. We've got products on there for you that we actually sell. And then there's a list of companies that support us. And by supporting them, you support us. So thank you very much. That's studentofthegun.com slash culture. Yep. Yep. Uh, we don't, not everybody has an SOTG promo code, but some people do. And if you use that promo code, then that lets them know uh, that you're paying attention and that you are a student of the gun. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be back tomorrow, Thursday, with a bonus hour. This is going to be cool. This is going to be kind of cool. Chicago admits culpability for crime spike. Well, sort of. <laughs> sort of. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into that tomorrow. But until then, uh, well, first of all, go to GetSOTG.com. Sign up so you can be here tomorrow and Friday uh, for the bonus hours because you want that. You should want it. If you don't. Fix yourself and want it. Uh, but until then, remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life. <laughs>